following is a production of the Media Ministry at New Salem Baptist Church in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee. In the metro Chattanooga area, we invite you to be our guest at any of our weekly worship services or visit us online at newsalembaptist.net. You may be seated. Great to see you this morning. So glad you are here. Great to have folks join us online as well. And we're excited that we're able to come back. No matter where you may be sitting, we're able to join together and celebrate God today and to worship Him. And we especially want to welcome you if this is your first time with us today, whether you're new in the building or new online. We're glad to have you with us. We'd love the chance to get to know you a little bit. The way we do that in the building is if you picked up a worship bulletin on your way in, you'll find a little card in there that you can use to communicate with us, and you just put your contact info on there, and then as you leave after the service, you'll notice by either one of the back doors, there's a little white box. Just drop it in there, and we'll be in touch real soon. If you're online and you're ready to start that conversation, you can go to our website at newsalembaptist.net, scroll down the homepage, and there's a form there you can use to get in touch with us. And we'd love to, to hear from folks, love to see where folks are joining us from, because we know they're not only in our hometown, but we've got people all over the country that are uh, joining us for worship as well. We're glad to have you along with us. We have so much to be thankful for, even with all the crazy stuff that's going on. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. For one thing, uh, you folks have been very, very faithful, and uh, even though we haven't published a financial report in a while, uh, you folks have been giving, and the church is in the black, and that is a good thing right now. So thank you so much. We're going to try to, it, we, we're not trying to hide anything, it's just with all the other things we're having to juggle right now, we don't always remember to get that posted <laughs> online somewhere. So we're going to try to do that real soon. We thought about sending a newsletter out this month that we could have inserted that into, but uh, we do share that with the deacons every month. 
and uh, you folks have been, you know, we've been more than meeting expenses, so thank you so much for your faithfulness. I did have somebody ask me this morning uh, about the online giving, so let me just pass this along to remind you. We, we push the online giving under these circumstances just because it is so convenient. So many people find it easier, but uh, there's also, like with any other transaction you do online, there is a small uh, fee attached to that. Uh, it's, I think, 3%. Uh, so there's one or two ways to handle that. One way is you can, you know, if you if you want to give online and, and that three percent bothers you, you just adjust your gift accordingly to cover that. Or you can also mail gifts in, and we also have a, a, a place uh, that where you can drop those off. And I'm not going to publicize that, but if you want to contact us in the office, we'll be happy to tell you how to utilize that place where you can drop gifts off and. Uh, and get them to us that way. Plus, we also have the boxes in the auditorium if you're attending worship in person. Uh, as you leave today, you can drop those off in those boxes, and, and those are secure, and uh, we, we receive gifts that way. But thank you so much for your faithfulness and your support. Thank you. We also want to give thanks to God because he has been so faithful to bring us through the last 11 months. And uh, it is, you know, sometimes it, you, you got to look hard, but it's, it's really cool to look and see God's hand at work behind the scenes and see some of the things. I, I can tell you, some stories I've seen recently of people just going above and beyond to be generous and supportive of other people in their church family. And that is so encouraging, especially in times like these. So thank you so much. Today also happens to be, on the calendar, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. This is, we're uh, adjacent to the anniversary of the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. And so every year, believers all over the country uh, stop and focus on what that has meant for our nation and the fact that, that you have to wonder if so many of the things that are happening to us right now aren't in part a result of that disregard for life that was shown by that, that decision and by all the, uh, that's come from that. Uh, we want to uphold the, the value of human life. God has created us in his image, not just the unborn, but also those at the, end, the other end of the spectrum, our elderly, and remember to give them dignity and honor as well. Uh, to remember that all human life is valuable and created in God's image, and we need to, to value that. So we want to spend just a moment as we pray today thanking God for that and also praying for a variety of needs that people have expressed to us. One of our deacons, Brother Bobby Klein, is going to come and share some of those needs with you, and he's going to lead us in prayer this morning. Brother Bobby? We got a lot of, of uh, names here, so just pray with me as I, as I try to pronounce them properly and correctly. So let's go ahead and get down get to it. Uh, Doc Yearin, Joe Vandergriff, Jerry Holloway, Jim Daly, Missy Campbell, June Allison, Judy Jordan, Bob and Judy Miller, Faye Porter, Nick Daltrey, Angie McNabb, Sheila Woody, Joel and Debbie Kraft, Nancy Uren, Shirley Cox, Tammy Boza, Claude Lamb, Tina Newman, Steve Burke, fire and police and first responders and teachers, service men and women, healthcare workers, our president and leaders, our pastor, and worship team and church workers, our children and youth ministries and their leaders, the lost, our, our nation, healing from Corona-19 virus, cities where there is unrest, people who are out of work, our sick and shut-ins, people who have lost loved ones, Ronnie Jones, Patrick Williams, Art and Tammy Warner, Mark Everett, Jerry Johnson, Kitty Ruth Harrison, Kathy Loftus family in their passing of her mother, Judy McDaniel, Robin Hale, Celia Bosney, Kay Upton, Pete and Connie Nix, 
Joyce Jehokum, Deidre King, Juanita and Jean Stone, Jack Johnson, Daryl Dover, Raina Morrison, Freddie and Judy Weiss, Donna Lee, William Loftus, James Newman, Ken and Lois Johnson, Tom and Sandy Hughes, Wayne and Polly Atmaker, Tommy and Joanne Smith, Martha Hudson, Elizabeth Mayfield, and Sandra Jordan. Anybody else to go back to that? Well, uh, just pray for all these people that I've mentioned names for, and just, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Dear Lord, thank you for what you've done for us today, and thank you for being with us and letting us come to church and and worship in your name. And just pray that you'll be with each and every one of us as we go our separate ways during the, during the next week, to always be in your will. And be with all these names that I've mentioned, that that you'll just have your hand in each each situation and uh, be with each and, every, each and every one of these families, Father. And Father, just pray that you'll be with each and every one of us as we try to do your best and do your will in your most heavenly name. Amen.
may be seated. Abraham Lincoln knew a thing or two about perseverance. Lincoln led the country through one of the most difficult chapters in its history. As he attempted to navigate the crisis of the war between the states, uh, half the country hated him. And even people in his own party doubted him. And everybody had an opinion on how he should do his job even though there was no manual for how to do this. No one had ever led a republic like this through such a crisis. In the middle of that crisis, Lincoln once remarked, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that no matter where, that I have nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and all about me seemed insufficient in that day. Now, like Lincoln, we also face a time where our nation is conflicted from within and afflicted from without. And as we each try to sort out our personal position on the great issues of the day, perhaps in this area the best position we could be in is like Lincoln, down on our knees. Now, over the last few weeks, as we've talked about our key priorities for 2021, we've talked about walking more faithfully or or walking more full of faith. We've talked about worshiping more passionately. Today we're going to add another priority. And if you'll repeat after me, in 2021, I resolve to pray more fervently. Now there are a lot of passages we could turn to in the Bible that teach us how to pray. Uh, And we're going to touch on some of those this morning, but we're going to spend particular focus on a passage from James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, that specifically mentions the power of fervent prayer. Now, James is a good teacher to consult on prayer. In in case you didn't know, James was the half-brother of Jesus, the son of of, uh, Mary and Joseph, and he grew up as a devout Jew. According to the Gospels, While Jesus was traveling around ministering around the countryside, James thought he was a little crazy. Literally. He thought he'd been out in the sun too long. But after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, then James became a true believer. And he became actually an influential leader in the very first church, the one that was located there in Jerusalem. Uh, He was known for both his wisdom and his personal piety. Church tradition also tells us uh, that James had a nickname. Now, we don't know how accurate this is, but according to church tradition, he was known as Old Camel Knees, because apparently he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that he developed thick calluses there. Uh, If that's the worst thing people can say about you, that's not too bad, right? Uh, Now, whether or not that's actually true, we don't know, but it's undeniable that James understood the power of prayer, and he has a lot to teach us. As we work our way through this passage, I want you to notice three key things about prayer. Okay, three ideas I want you to take away this morning. The first is to pray with purpose. Pray with purpose. Let's look at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, it occurs to me uh, that we may have someone hearing this message this morning who maybe didn't grow up in church, and so you are just totally clueless about this whole prayer business. No worries. 
I guarantee you there are a lot of people uh, either sitting in this room or joining us online who have been in church all their lives, and they're clueless about prayer too. So in a lot of ways, we're all in the same boat. Uh, we're gonna, let's spend a few minutes just backing up for a second and defining what prayer is and how to pray. Okay? Basically, prayer is communicating with God. At its heart, prayer is just talking with God. And you don't have to use a lot of flowery language, but you do need to be honest and open about expressing your thoughts and feelings to God. Can I let you in on a little secret? He already knows what you're thinking and feeling anyway. So you might as well be honest about it. But we, we talk with God, and, and it's best prayer is a conversation where we express ourselves to God and we listen for him to respond. Now, maybe not in the ways you're used to expecting, okay? Uh, it's not like God you know, speaks from heaven with a loud, booming voice. I've only had a couple of, of occasions in my life where I thought I've heard a voice I couldn't explain, you know? And uh, those are very particular situations. And uh, if you are hearing voices, I encourage you to think very, very closely before you follow those and make sure you're listening to the right voices. Uh, but uh, uh, God speaks in other ways. God speaks to us primarily through his word, through the scriptures. He speaks to us through the example and the teachings of Jesus. He speaks to us through worship. He speaks to us through circumstances. He speaks to us through other people that he sends into our lives to share wisdom with us. And so we have to attune ourselves to listening for God to respond. And th those responses don't always come in the ways that we expect. But when we pray, we are praying to God, we're talking with God, and we're expecting Him in some way to communicate back to us. But prayer is also not only conversation, it is also acknowledging our dependence on God. Have you ever noticed a lot of us have trouble asking for help? You know, a lot of us are like a preschooler who just learned to tie their shoes or put on a jacket, you know, and you see them struggling, and you, try to, you start to help them, they say, no, me do, me do. You know, and, and then they get frustrated after a few minutes and they finally turn around and say, help. That's the way a lot of us are with God, okay? Uh, when, we, when we ask for help, we have to admit that in ourselves we are not adequate to meet the needs of the moment. And that's a blow against our pride, isn't it? When we reach out to God in prayer, we are admitting that we need Him to face whatever crisis or trial that we're facing. So prayer is an acknowledgement of that need. And along with that, in prayer, we are expressing our trust in God. By reaching out to God, we are saying that we, we have a level of trust that he is adequate. We may not be adequate, but he is adequate to address our need. We're also expressing trust that God wants to help us face whatever crisis or struggle has prompted us to pray. It's not like, you know, we're getting God's voicemail, okay? God, we're not, we're not bothering God. God wants us to come to him in this way because of this relationship we are trying to establish with him. And then finally, or fourthly, prayer is aligning our hearts with God's priorities. Aligning our hearts with God's priorities. One of the big misconceptions people have about prayer is that somehow prayer is about convincing God to take a certain action. Uh, the Bible teaches us very clearly that God does, God does respond to our prayers, okay? God responds. He hears. He acts. But it's not like God is sitting around just waiting for you to give him advice on what he needs to do. I guarantee you, he already knows what he's planning to do. He's just waiting for you to get up to speed, okay? And prayer is one of the ways we do that. Uh, when we seek God in prayer, the more we seek him in prayer, the more our hearts begin to move in tune with his. Consider what Jesus meant when he said uh, in places like John 14, verses 13 through 14, and whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I'll do it. Now let me tell you what that doesn't mean, okay? This, this kind of throws some people sometimes. That doesn't mean all you have to do is tack the phrase in Jesus' name on the end of your prayer and tell how God is obligated to give you that new truck you've been praying for. That's not how this works. Okay? To pray in someone's name means to align yourself with their priorities and plans. 
Uh, our nation sends out dozens of ambassadors all over the world to various countries. And those ambassadors are attended, intended to represent the interests of the United States in whatever country they happen to be serving. They are serving in our name. Now, as long as they're acting in our name, those ambassadors are not free to go freelance and do whatever they want and say, well, you know what? I don't like this policy. I don't like that policy. So this is what I'm going to recommend through my diplomacy. No, 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 no. They are required to take their direction from the priorities and strategies established by the U.S. State Department. Okay? Because they are acting in the name of the United States people. In a similar way, to pray in Jesus' name is to seek to align ourselves with what Jesus wants, not necessarily what we want. Think carefully about what the psalmist says in Psalm 37, verse 4. That verse says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, wow, all I got to do is delight myself in the Lord. And it's like the key to the candy store. Uh, no. Think about this, okay? Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. If the Lord is truly what you delight in, what's going to be the desire of your heart? More of him. Exactly. His will. If we're delighting in the Lord, God fulfills that desire by giving us more of himself. He becomes, he himself becomes the answer to our prayers. Now, now that we've established a little bit about what prayer is, uh, let's focus for just a minute on the very practical question of how to pray. Uh, this is where a lot of people struggle. I, you know, how do I pray? How do I get started? What do I do? Uh, there are different ways to approach this. We have models and examples in Scripture. Jesus actually gives us a model prayer in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. And I want to share with you a simple outline that somebody shared with me years and years ago that's really helped me, and I've shared it with hundreds of people. It's kind of loosely based on the model that Jesus gives in Matthew 6, although it's rearranged a little bit to fit a nice little acrostic, and that acrostic is the word acts. Okay. Now, many of you have already heard this, but just in case there's somebody who's really, you know, looking for help on how do I pray. Let me run through this real quick and see if this helps you. In fact, sometimes what I do is I take a piece of paper and I write acts down the side of it. And then out to the side of each letter, I write what I'm wanting to communicate to God. It helps me you know, formulate and organize my prayers. Uh, a stands for adoring God for who he is and what he has done. Adoration. And adoration is simply another word for worship. In his model prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, Jesus taught us to begin our prayers in worship. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Think of it this way. Worship is basically tuning in your radio to God's frequency. Okay, shutting out all the other distractions and all the other distractions, rather, and focusing on God. So you begin your prayer just by, you know, God, I want to worship you right now because. Uh, and if you need help, think about how the scriptures describe God. God, you, your word tells me that you see everything I'm doing, you know everything I'm feeling, and you never abandoned me. Lord, I want to thank you because you are worthy of my devotion. You are always faithful. I don't have to doubt your love. And you just rehearse all those things that you know about God. And that helps you focus in on him and prepares your heart to continue the conversation. The C stands for confessing your sins and struggles. A lot of times, when the closer we draw to God, the more we realize how unlike God we are. And our tendency is to try to hide that up, okay? Cover that up. Hey, God already knows about it. Might as well come clean. James even talks about confessing our sins to one another in this passage. But we confess to God our failures, our struggles. God, this is what I'm wrestling with right now. This is where I've fallen short. I really need your help to overcome this. T stands for Thanking God for his blessings, thanksgiving. Spend a moment to think about all the ways God has shown up in your life. God, thank you. I have a roof over my head. Thank you there's food in my fridge. Thank you that my family is healthy. Think of all the ways that God has met your needs. And that, again, helps you focus in on him. And then finally, this is where we get to the part most of us focus on. The S stands for, and here's a big fancy biblical word for you supplicating your needs to God. Supplicating, what's that? Basically, that means to ask for help. 
We ask God for help. Now, notice in this pattern, asking for God's help comes a little further down the priority list. How would you feel if every time your friends called you up, they treated you like the Walmart grocery pickup? Hey, friend, I need this, 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 and this. See you later, bye. <laughs> Think about that. But isn't that the way we treat God most of the time? Hey, God, here's what I need. Here's what I want. Now, Jesus taught us in Matthew 6, 8, your father knows what you need even before you ask him. Okay? He already knows what you really need. So God doesn't necessarily want your shopping list. What he wants is you. And he wants you to focus on him. Spend some time in your prayers focusing on your relationship with God first, and then you'll, you come to sharing your needs with him. God, this is what I'm, what, where I need you right now. Here's the problem I'm wrestling with. Give me some guidance on this. Now, we've kind of established a little bit, and that's just a brief thing on, on what prayer is and how we pray. Let's focus in now on what James teaches us about knowing when to pray. Okay, There's a variety of circumstances James outlines in this passage about when we should reach out to God in prayer. And the first one is, pray when you are facing challenges. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? The word from Greek translated suffering here is used in the New Testament to refer to all kinds of difficult trials. For example, 2 Timothy 2 verse 9, Paul uses this very same word to describe his imprisonment for the preaching of the gospel. Later in 2 Timothy, in chapter 4, verse 5, Paul uses this very same word again in encouraging his apprentice Timothy. He says, but as for you, you self-restraint in all things, endure hardship. That's the same word that James uses right here for suffering. Do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So basically, Timothy, as you're going out and you're facing the, all this, this pushback, you just stay the course and you keep preaching the gospel, Timothy. No matter what hardship or what struggling you're suffering, you're facing. So when you are, anybody facing a hardship? Anybody facing some suffering right now? It's a great opportunity to pray. God, I'm struggling. Help. When you're facing a hardship, it is absolutely appropriate to pour out your fears and frustrations to God and to ask him for strength to endure your trials. That's a given. The next one may surprise you. We pray when we're suffering but we also pray when we're celebrating victories again he says is anyone cheerful <laughs> he's to sing praises well pastor that talks about singing in this context these songs are prayers to god remember that a lot of first century jewish prayers were actually put to music they were chanted or they were sung the uh, songs we just sang in this service were picked out very intentionally because they're all very vertically focused they're basically prayers set to music, okay? So think back about the words you just sang a few minutes ago. We were talking to God. At least we were giving you that opportunity to. Like any good father, God loves to hear about what his children are excited about. One of the things that I enjoy when my kids were growing up, you know, picking them up after school, they hop in the car and the person is, Dad, you won't believe what happened today. This, this happened and that happened. You know, a lot of times, you know, as parents, we just kind of glaze over and say, yeah, yeah. But I always enjoyed that because they're letting me into their world. They're sharing with me the things that were important to them. And that was helping build that relationship with them. And it's the same way with God. God wants to hear you talk about what you're facing, what you're excited about, your passions, your dreams, what you are excited is going on in your life. He already knows it. But he wants to hear you talk about it. So celebrate in prayer. He also says, James tells us to pray when you are in need. In verses 14 and 15, James calls on sick people to invite church leaders to pray over them and anoint them with oil. Now, uh, James is dealing here, first of all, with the importance of pastoral ministry in the church community. The elders of the church include the pastors and the other influential leaders in the church. And note that where James puts the, uh, the burden on where to initiate this process, okay? He invites those who are sick to take the initiative in inviting the leaders to pray. Um, and the reason I, I want to point this out is because, just remember, your pastor, your deacon are not omniscient. Only God's omniscient, right? And don't assume 
that we automatically know what you're struggling with. Uh, I'll never forget, this happened years ago in another state, in another church, but I got chewed out on the phone one day by a lady who was not a member of our church because no one had been by the hospital to pray for her husband, who was a member of our church. He'd been there for a week, and uh, nobody had been by to see him. And so I said, ma'am, well, did you think to call and let us know? Well, you should have just known. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, just, there's a little something called HIPAA. You know, the hospitals don't call. Uh, I mean, they're busy and they don't, they got privacy to worry about. They don't call the pastor and tell them that somebody from our church is there. And I don't have a direct pipeline to God. You know, hey, Joe's in the hospital. Go check on him. We need to know, okay, if, if you're sick or somebody in your family is sick, then reach out to us. Let us know. And we've got structures in our church, you know, set up for that. You can contact the office. You can contact your deacon to, to let them know. And that gets, you know, we, we share that information. But, but help us to be part of the process. We'd love to pray for you. We just got to know that you need prayer. Um, now, of course, a lot of times, you know, with, thanks to COVID, I, I don't get to go to the hospital very much to pray with people. A lot of my prayer takes place over the phone these days. Uh, I look forward to the day when we're able to go and comfort and encourage people as they're going through stuff like this. But, but let us know that you need prayer. It's, it's okay to contact us and let us know that. James is also here hinting at the importance of or maybe hinting at the importance not only of prayer but of practical service that goes beyond just praying and the reason I say that is because of all the controversy related to this phrase anointing with oil okay there's been a lot of discussion over the centuries over exactly what James meant by that and you may be wondering as we read that passage what does that mean anointing with oil uh, part of the uncertainty is caused by a lack of information that we have in the New Testament regarding this process. The, now, we, we have in the Bible, there are, there are other types of anointing that are mentioned. We're like, you know, a, a, a building or a, a priest is anointed or a king is anointed as a way of symbolizing and they are set apart for God's use. But this is something a little, apparently a little different. The only other place it's described is Mark 6, 13. And in that passage, it describes how Jesus commissioned his disciples to go out in Mark's words, casting out many demons, anointing with oil many sick people, and healing them. We're not really beyond that, given any specifics over how this was done or why. Okay? Uh, the, uncertainty, the uncertainty is also contributed to by James' choice of words. In Greek, which is what the New Testament was written in, there are two different words for anointing or the application of oil. Now, one word very definitely describes that sacramental application, like in a ceremony to set apart a priest or a king. That's not the word James uses here, however. The other is simply, it basically means smearing or rubbing on oil. Now, it can be used in that sacramental sense, but most of the time it's not. So we don't know exactly what James meant here. Uh, he uses the word for smearing on oil. Now, that's led to a variety of theories over exactly what James is talking about. I'm just going to throw them out to you and let you make up your own mind, okay? Uh, over the centuries, a lot of Christians have opted for a, what we call a sacramental meaning. means that somehow applying the oil conveys some kind of actual healing grace to the sick person. That they get, you know, there, there's something in the oil that energizes them or actually brings healing into their body. If you're familiar with the Roman Catholic practice of extreme unction, you know, last rites, that comes from this passage and from that tradition. Uh, most of us don't tend to accept that. Uh, there's a couple of other possibilities. It could be James had a practical meaning in mind. Because remember, in the first century, a lot of first century medicines were based on various oils. Now you hit moms thought essential oils were a new thing. No, back then they used oil for medicine. So it may be James meant, you know, the elders come in and you take care of the, of the medical issue, you know, what you can with the medical issue first, and then you pray over them. Now, that's not, it's not a slam dunk, but that's what he means here because of some of the other things he says. But uh, it, it is a good thing to think about, you know, there's nothing in the New Testament that tells us we can't utilize available medical technology. Okay, it's there for a reason. God gave us brains. He gave us doctors. And a lot of times when I pray for people who are sick, I will pray for their doctors and nurses. But I'll also pray that when human medicine reaches its limits, that God's divine power takes over. Because here's, you know, if a doctor's honest, 
He will tell you he's not the one who does the healing. All he can do is set the conditions for healing to be promoted. Okay? The healing comes from God. Because there are times when doctors do everything they know to do, and it doesn't help. The body doesn't respond. So ultimately, healing comes from God. And it could be that, you know, James is talking about doing the practical medicine of, of the time. Or he could be, have in mind a symbolic meaning. Because in the scriptures, oil is often used as a symbol of the presence of God's spirit. So it could just be a symbolic thing that as we are anointing with your oil, we're also recognizing God is here and God has his hand on you. You decide for yourself which of those you think is right. Bottom line is, if it helps you and strengthens your faith to ask me to come and pray and anoint you with a little oil, I got a little vial of olive oil I, I, I have for that purpose. And we're happy to do that. Okay? It, the emphasis of the passage is not on the anointing with oil. The emphasis on the passage is the prayer offered to God in faith on behalf of the person who's sick. That's where the weight is. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a moment, but uh, I want to point out one other circumstance that James mentions here for you when we should pray. Okay, when we're, when we're suffering, when we're celebrating, when we're sick, or pray when you are struggling with sin. Again, verse 16. James reminds us, a lot of our suffering may flow out of our own sinful choices. Chickens coming home to roost because of mistakes we've made, lines we've crossed. In this case, it's important to be open and honest about those failures. If you try to hide them, you'll never find relief from them. He calls us to support one another in this, to be open and honest with one another. You know, what would happen in church if we strove to create an atmosphere where people felt free to do that? To say, hey, I'm messed up. I need y'all to pray for me. But too often, we walk around with the spiritual equivalent of these on, hiding who we really are. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Think about the healing power that comes from having that burden of guilt taken off your soul. That, all that anxiety, all that worry of being caught and found out, just gone. It is liberating. Pray for one another. Not only do we pray with purpose, James also encourages us to pray with faith. Let me remind you, in verse 15, he says, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. As we hinted on a few minutes earlier, the power is not in the prayer, but in the one to whom you are praying. Okay? That's where the power is. Notice what James does not say the healing comes from. It doesn't come from the elders. It doesn't come from the anointing with oil. The healing doesn't even come from the prayer itself. According to James, the thing that leads to healing is the prayer offered in faith. In other words, what James is talking about is the kind of prayer that expresses that trust in God. God's the one who provides the answer to our prayers. However, this doesn't mean that all we have to do is pray loudly enough and long enough just to get what we want. It goes hold back the whole aligning with God's purposes thing because sometimes God's got to different idea and we got to be willing to trust him on that faith trusts God even when his answer is not the one we want you probably heard the story about the, the guy who was hiking up on the mountain and uh, slipped and fell off the edge of the cliff and on the way over he managed to reach out and grab this one lone branch that was sticking out of the side of that mountain and he's hanging on there for dear life and hollering for what seemed an eternity and his, his arms are starting to get tired, and his grip's starting to get a little shaky. And in desperation, he calls out, God, if you're there, please help me. And all of a sudden, this voice comes out, my child, I hear you. I will catch you. Just let go of the branch. The guy thinks for a minute, and he says, is there anybody else up there? We have to learn to trust God enough to let go of the branch. Sometimes we don't get the answer we're expecting. Sometimes we have to let go of the expectations we have and trust that God's in control and he has a plan. 
the phrase, you know, the phrase that God will raise him up can actually have a couple of different meanings. It can mean, yeah, God will raise him up from the illness. But it also could mean the Lord will raise him up from the dead on the last day. Remember, for the believer, physical death is sometimes the gateway to ultimate healing. We have to think so much bigger when God's involved. So pray with faith. And also, pray with fervency. Going back to the end of verse 16, the effective, or sometimes that translated the fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And then in verses 17 and 18, he brings up an example of this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it didn't rain on earth for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, you got to understand, to James' audience, Elijah was a superstar, okay? Elijah was one of the prophets in the Old Testament, in the book of 1 Kings. And uh, Elijah was, man, this guy who walked with God so tightly that he actually didn't die. In the end, God sent a chariot from heaven to give, get him and take him home, okay? And, I mean, he did all these great works in his career. And you, I mean, people put Elijah on a pedestal. He was a spiritual superhero. And James says, you know, Elijah, he's somebody just like us. And if you read Elijah's story, if you actually read his story in 1 Kings, you see that. I mean, Elijah got depressed. Elijah had a short temper. He got angry with people. I mean, he struggled with a lot of the same things we struggle with. Sometimes we think, you know, well, the pastor or the deacon or the Sunday school or whatever, or, or that singer, I mean, they're, they're just so on a, such a different plane than I am. Guess what, folks? I wrestle with the same things you wrestle with. I face the same temptations you face with. I have the same hang-ups you have. The only thing different about me and you is my role. Okay? God gives us each a role in the body. Mine just happens to be a little more visible. But I struggle with the same things you struggle with. I make the same mistakes you make. And Elijah faced the same weaknesses as us. But he experienced great victories from God. And Elijah prayed faithfully for three years before God moved. The story is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. It's a kind of a long story. But basically, God sent Elijah to warn wicked King Ahab, you better change your ways or I'm going to send drought upon this land. And sure enough, he did. And for three long years, that drought continued. And during that entire time, Elijah remained faithful to keep proclaiming God's message. And let me tell you, Elijah was not a very popular person during this time. Guess who everybody blamed for the drought? Not King Ahab. They blamed the messenger. And Ahab and his wife Jezebel, all they could think about was, we want Elijah's head. How, you know, we need to kill that guy, because look at all the trouble he's brought on us. And yet... Elijah remained faithful. He kept preaching the message God had given, and he kept praying that God would move in the land. Finally, everything came to a head, and Elijah called for a showdown between himself and Ahab's small army of pagan priests. The showdown took place on, at a place called Mount Carmel. Beautiful place. I've been there. There's actually a statue there today of Elijah with his sword raised to the sky, and it's a, it's a pretty impressive sight. But uh, they had this showdown. Basically, God was, they, they both built altars. The pagan priests prayed to their gods. Elijah prayed to the God of the Bible. And whoever answered, that was going to be the one who won. And God showed up in a pretty dramatic fashion to prove himself that day. And the people turned on the pagan priest and began to seek the Lord once again. And right after that, Elijah prayed. And guess what? The rains came. Three and a half years with no rain. And when Elijah prayed, it came. Is that because Elijah was something special? No, it's because Elijah was faithful. Because he trusted God, that God was going to do what God promised to do. That God had a plan. James' point is not that Elijah was anything more spe special or spectacular than any of us, but that Elijah remained faithful for three long years, and he kept praying. Despite the cost 
despite the difficulties of that faithfulness. Jesus often spoke about perseverance in prayer. In one famous story, Jesus told about a little poor widow lady who didn't have the money to bribe the corrupt judge. So what she did instead was follow him around and pester him until he agreed to hear her case. Poor guy's going out to lunch at his favorite restaurant, and this lady shows up. Hey, Your Honor, you, you consider my case yet? He's probably at the country club getting ready to tee off. Hey, Your Honor, what about my case? Follows her, him around everywhere. And finally, to shut her up, Jesus says, he says, Lady, I will hear your case. Now, the point is not that God's like that corrupt, dishonest judge, and we just got to keep pestering and pestering and pestering and pestering until finally he throws up his hand and says, Okay, will you shut up already? I'll do it. That's not the point. The point Jesus is trying to make is that if even a corrupt, dishonest human judge will eventually give in to the pleas of the helpless, how much more a loving and compassionate Heavenly Father who's already predisposed to give good gifts to His children. That's the kind of Father we are praying to. Why is it so often that we treat prayer as the last resort when really it should be the first resource we turn to? What does it say about our faith in God that we often give up so easily and stop praying before we get an answer? Jesus told another story. In, uh, that, that, the story about the widows in Luke 18. This story is in Luke 15. It's about a young man who's a little rebellious turned against his father, and ran away from home. His luck ran out, his money ran out, he, he finally hit bottom, and he said, you know what, I'm just going to crawl back home and beg my dad to take me back. And his expectation was, I guess, that his father was going to be standing there, kind of like the way I think a lot of us imagine God is, with his arms crossed and a scowl on his face, just waiting for us to come grovel at his feet. But that's not what the young man found. Instead, what he found was his father had been sitting on the front porch waiting for him, looking over the horizon for any sight that his son was coming home. And when he saw that figure pop over the horizon, he threw the quorum aside and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, despite all the smell and the dirt and the grime, and he hugged him. And he said, my son who was dead is alive again. That is our Heavenly Father. He's just waiting for us to turn to Him, to seek Him out, to pour out our hearts to Him, to trust that He is seeking our best interests, even if we don't understand what those interests are. Do you trust Him enough? to turn to him and keep running towards him until you get there. To keep turning to him and say, Father, here I am. I'm broken. I'm scared. But I know you love me. And so I'm going to trust you. Take me and lead me from this point forward. God invites us to his table. Are you ready to come home? We're going to sing one more song today. And as we sing uh, this song, I want you to think really carefully about the words. And it may be that you're here or you're watching this and, you know, you've been running from God all your life. And maybe you had an idea of God that you're finding out is not accurate. That actually is very different than what you had imagined. And you feel yourself being drawn to him. God so loved you, he sent his own son into the world to die on your behalf. To take the death you and I deserve for our failures and our mistakes. And in exchange, his eternal life in its place. And he offers you that gift. A, a, a chance to be reconciled with your creator. To have all the yuck wiped away. To get a fresh start. And never have to walk alone again. And it starts by reaching out in faith and taking him by the hand. And saying, okay, God, I'm ready to trust you. If that's you today, we want to give an opportunity to express that. As we sing, I'll be standing here at the front. I invite you to step out. Even if you, you, know, you say, Pastor, I don't understand all this. I just know I need Christ. I need to give myself to Christ. Can you tell me more? 
Maybe you're watching online and you feel that same drawing. You can go to our, our website at newsalembaptist.net slash decision and there's a form there you can use to let us know that you've made that decision to follow Christ and, and we'll be in touch to talk about the next steps. Maybe you've received Christ but you haven't taken the step of telling the world that you belong to him, that you've made that decision and you want to do that by following him in baptism. This is your opportunity, whether you're here in person or online, to let us know that you're ready to take that step and we'll get the machinery in motion. Maybe you're a believer, you've been baptized, but you've been kind of out wandering on your own and you need a church family to be part of. So where you have people you can confess your sins to and pray for each other and love each other and encourage each other and you believe God's led you here to be part of this family. This is your opportunity to let us know that you want to officially unite with our church. You just, I'll be happy to explain to you the different ways we accept members. Maybe you just need to come spend some time at the altar this morning, talking with your Heavenly Father, getting some things worked out. However He is leading you today, whether you're in person or online, as we sing, come to His table. You'll find Him waiting there for you.
just a couple of quick announcements today, if you can bear with us. Thank you for being here. We hope that this has been an encouragement and a blessing to you, whether you're here in person or you're joining us online. Uh, to remind you, for the rest of the month, because of what's going on in our community right now, we've paused all of our small group meetings, children's ministry, nursery meetings. Uh, our student ministry is still trying to do a few things virtually, uh, but it's, it's a challenge. But uh, we're doing that to try to keep people safe. It's easier in the big group to kind of keep our distance and practice social distancing than it is in the smaller groups. But we are keeping a close eye on the reports from our health department. Uh, and the last few days, there's been kind of a, hopefully a leveling off. And we'll see how that develops if maybe things are starting to head in the right direction. But at least through January, we're going to pause those meetings until things get a little more manageable. But you can still join us Wednesday night online for our midweek Bible study. We've been talking a lot about character and the importance of Christian character. Uh, it's kind of a discipleship-focused study. On, it's on Facebook Live, and then we replay it on our YouTube channel the next night. So I uh, encourage you, if you can't join us Wednesday night at 630, catch it later. Catch the thing. We, we've been having a great time. We have a lot of participation, a lot of folks tuning in on that. So we're really excited about that. Uh, a project we've got going on right now that's been going tremendously well. I don't know if you're concerned about uh, what's going on in the homeless community. Even out here in our area, we're seeing more and more people. Uh, who are homeless and homeless camps and such. There's an initiative in our county right now called the FUSE Initiative. And the, the idea is to get people who are wrestling with mil mental illness or substance abuse off the streets, get them in an apartment, and connect them with the resources they need to kind of get their lives back on track. And we are helping in that by helping outfit an apartment for one of the people participating in this project. And we've got a display out here that lists some of the items we're looking for. And we've had a tremendous response a lot of you have already brought stuff in. I think the biggest thing we're looking for right now is cleaning supplies. Uh, there's a few other things. If you're interested in helping out, you can visit the display in the, in, the, in the lobby. If you're watching online, this sounds like something you'd like to help out with. You can contact our office, either on the phone or through email, and we'll be happy to share with you what the needs still are. But we're hoping to have somebody, a representative from this program with us early in February uh, to, for us to turn this stuff over and kind of hear a little more about what is what this project is all about but we're excited to be part of this now as we get ready to leave today just gonna, let me leave you with this word may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the holy spirit you may abound in hope god bless you have a great week